binding and loosing. Now there's something that might upset the apple cart. Hey everybody, welcome to Behold and Sing. I'm so glad you're with me today. It's been a couple minutes. I uh, went to Ohio, visited some family, had a great time, enjoyed spending time with my mom and nieces and nephews and siblings and just really reconnecting a little bit and, and enjoying every moment of it. So I was glad to be there, but I'm equally glad to be back with you today. Binding and loosing, that's what we're going to talk about. And I'm going to give you a warning ahead of time. I'm not going to share what I've shared about it in the past because I don't believe I understood it correctly in the past. I think I was off. And it's okay to say that. I know some, some people think that if they have to admit that they've been wrong, that some tragedy is going to occur. But really, it's not. It's good to be truthful and humble and honest and say, you know what? I misunderstood it. I'm not going to blame those that I followed and those that taught me because it was my responsibility to dig into the word myself, to look deeply, to rightly divide the word of truth and to find out what the Bible really teaches us about binding and loosing. Okay. I've heard it taught as The prayer of binding and loosing, it's not a prayer. We're about to discover what it is, so hang on. This is going to be probably a little bit longer than normal, but I hope that you'll believe that it is worth it in the end. So let's pray. Let's, Let's do that today. Father, in the name of Jesus, I do ask, Father, that only your words would come out of me today. And I pray for those who are watching, those who are listening, those who are hearing. I ask that you would open the scriptures to them as you've opened the scriptures to me. Continue to open to all of us. Oh, God, correct us where we need correction, Father. Deepen our understanding. Show us what your word means. Give us grace and mercy when we've missed it. Forgive us, oh, God. And help us to come into clear understanding of your word each and every day. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 16. And we're going to start in verse 13. So if you have your Bible, I encourage you to follow along with me. Don't just take what I say as the truth. Find out yourself. Find out yourself. Read the scripture. I encourage you to read 16, 17, and 18 straight through. Maybe even hit the pause button and do that before we spend our time together today. Okay? If you have, if you have the opportunity. If you don't, let's, let's go. Verse 13 in chapter 16 of Matthew says, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father, which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. He goes on to explain to them explicitly that he's he's got to die and be raised again on the third day. He's beginning to to lay that foundation in them. But it's it's so important, this conversation that he's having with the disciples and with Peter in particular. One of the things that I think over the years has been a bit misunderstood is that in verse 18, I say to you, he's talking to Peter, that you are Peter. So he, he's renaming him. He was Simon. Now I'm calling you Peter, which means a small rock. And upon this rock, this large foundation stone rock, 
I will build my church. Now, some have taught that this is the rock of revelation. That's a great sermon I've heard many times. However, it doesn't make sense to me because Jesus is the rock. The Bible tells us that when they were in the wilderness, that they struck the, wa- the, the rock and water poured out, and that rock was Christ. We're, we're told in Ephesians that he's the cornerstone. And, and back in those days, when a building was erected, the cornerstone set the standard. The cornerstone was the most important. And every other stone laid against and upon that cornerstone had to be of the same exact quality. It had to come from the same quarry. It, it had to be the same kind of stone. Jesus, the cornerstone upon this rock, I can almost imagine him doing this upon this rock i will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it so he's building his church and i'm confident that he's going to finish well he's the author and finisher of our faith i have that encouragement though sometimes i look around and say oh my goodness we seem to be in quite a mess but jesus is the author the finisher he will finish the church he will build it the gates of hell will not prevail So verse 19 is where we're going to get to. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever you will bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the the Greek language and how in the original this was understood. It was understood whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, okay? Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. So he's not telling them that they're going to set standards that heaven must follow, all right? So, so let's erase that thought that some have taught, that whatever you bind, whatever you decide, whatever you loose, whatever you decide. No, heaven decided Whatever you bind has already been bound. Whatever you loose is that which has already been loosed. Now, what we have to understand further is when we read the Bible, we're not reading words that were written to us today. We're reading words that were written to certain people in the Bible, in this time. This is a story about people, about the words of Jesus. This is an exact representation of what he said to men who were following him, Jewish men of Israel who would have understood this in a different context than we westernized, Americanized believers understand it. They knew what this meant because this word bind actually literally means to declare unlawful. To loose means to declare lawful. In this sense, in this passage, it's a legislative concept. They knew, the disciples knew, that when it came to the law of God, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, although they were taking their position illegally in that day, they would be the ones who would bind and loose. Okay, here's how the the rabbis describe it. They said, suppose someone came to the priest, okay, came to a Pharisee, came to a Sadducee, whoever they held as, as the one over them, and said, I have a problem that is not written precisely in the law. My dog died in my house. Well, the priest would say, where? In your house or outside your house? Well, in my house. That meant the house was unclean. But if the, if the man said the dog died outside my house, then he would have to ask further questions. Did the dog die away from the home or on the doorstep? Well, he died on the doorstep. Okay, one more question. Was his nose pointing toward the door or away from the door? Well, away from the door. Okay, you're good. You're clean. Your home, your property is clean. Okay, there, there were the laws of clean and unclean that were written in Leviticus, but some things were not written. And so they would go to the priest to say, is this lawful? What's lawful? What's unlawful? 
and the priest would bind, declare unlawful, or loose, declare lawful. So the disciples understood this was a legal conversation they were having. It was legislative in nature. And Jesus was telling them, you're going to have the keys of the kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom of earth, the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you declare unlawful must be what has already been declared unlawful in heaven. Whatever you declare lawful must be what has already been declared lawful in heaven. Okay, this is the first time that he is bringing this to their attention. He does not say it's a prayer. He does not say, bind the devil, loose blessing. Oh, we've been taught that message over and over and over. But it's quite interesting to me that as you move further on and, and Jesus is transfigured in chapter 17, and then he comes down the mountain. And in chapter 17, verse 14, he's confronted by the disciples who were unable to cast out a devil from a boy. Okay. We all know the story. We'll pick it up in verse 17. Jesus answered and said, Oh, faithless and perverse generation. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil. Doesn't say he bound the devil. It says he rebuked the devil, meaning he spoke to the devil, he made a command, he made a demand upon that devil, and the devil departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Now, it's interesting to me that the Holy Ghost decided to include that story. I don't know how much time passes from from Matthew 16 when he talks about binding and loosing until Matthew 17, when this event occurs, but it seems because it's included right after in the text, it would have been the perfect opportunity for there to be an example of Jesus binding the devil if that's what binding meant. But he's showing us that that's not what it means. Okay, keep everything in context. All right, then we move on. Jesus is again prophesying his death. We come to a point in 18 where he's going to again talk about binding and loosing, but in a, in a bit different aspect, okay? Let's just start in verse 1. Let's do some reading. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? They were always concerned about that. Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones, which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It's better for thee to enter into life, halt or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. He's, he's talking some intense stuff here. Verse 9, And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye, rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. And then he goes on to talk about the shepherd who would go after the one sheep, leave the 99 to rescue the one. Even so, verse 14 says, it is not the will of your father, which is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. Verse 15, he's going to shift. Now let's listen carefully. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee. So we, we've got to make sure that we don't offend, that we don't 
harm the little ones, not, not just the children. He is talking about the children, but the little ones in the kingdom, the ones that don't have much faith, the ones that don't have much knowledge, the ones that are new, the ones that are, that are the sheep that are weak and they're wandering from the flock. Let's not offend them, but especially the children, especially the children. Verse 15, now he says, okay, if your brother shall trespass against you, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, then thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. That was an Old Testament law. And if he shall neglect to hear thee, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Listen to verse 18. Now listen to this in context. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth. He's reminding them, what did I tell you before? Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Remember, whatsoever you bind on earth, you declare unlawful as that which has already been bound and declared on, uh, unlawful in heaven, that which you loose, you declare lawful, is that which has been loose and declared lawful in heaven? I'm not talking about binding devils. And I'm going to show you what we're not talking about loosing either in just a minute, because the Holy Ghost was so kind to give us context. Okay. Verse 19, again, I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, what are we talking about here? Not asking for cars and houses and clothing and blessing. We're talking about asking for wisdom. And moreover, Peter's going to say, well, there's some other things we need to ask for too in just a second. But listen to the context. If they agree as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my father, which is heaven for where two or three are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst of them. He's saying, when you make a judgment on someone, when you declare unlawful, when you declare lawful, if you agree, if you're together agreeing and you ask, I'll grant it. I'll show you what's declared unlawful in heaven. I'll show you what's declared lawful in heaven for where you are. I'm there in the midst. I'm there to tell you what to do. I'm there to give you direction. If you can't find it in my word, then you pray and you ask. But first we should go to the word and, and find out those things that are written. But as in the case of the rabbi and the dog that died, sometimes it's not written. Sometimes we've got to, we've got to reason together and we've got to go to prayer. How do we handle this situation? What's lawful? What's unlawful? What have you already decided in heaven? What's your judgment? Because in this setting, he was speaking to them about something judicial. The first one was legislative, the making of law. This is judicial, the deciding of how the law is incorporated, how it is carried out. Peter understands exactly what this is about because in verse 21, he says, then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him till seven times he knew he knew this was about forgiveness as much as it was about the declaration of lawfulness and unlawfulness. Jesus said, I, I say to you, un not until just seven times, but until 70 times seven. Come on, Peter. Therefore, in the kingdom of, is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. He goes on to tell the story of a king. I'm not going to, I'm not going to read that parable, but it was about a, a, a king who had a servant who owed a debt and the servant did not have to pay. And so he had to be taken to jail, but he begged forgiveness and the king forgave him. And then he went and he demanded from his brother like 10 bucks that he was owed and threw that brother into jail. So, 
listen, you've got to see the context. Binding and loosing, declaring lawful, declaring unlawful is also about granting forgiveness or withholding, not forgiveness, but withholding freedom. Sometimes people have to be arrested. Here's what I'm saying. Sometimes people have to be set out of the church body and treated as a publican, as a sinner. What did Paul say? Put that man out of your assembly so that he can hit the rock bottom and and repent and return and be restored. Judicial. Now there's one more in, in John chapter 20. Let me get there. Sorry, it's taking a second. All right. So Jesus has resurrected, and now he, in the evening, he's appearing to the disciples where they've been hiding out. So John chapter 20, verse 19, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. It wasn't until then that they truly knew who he was. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so I send you. How did he send him? Let's see, verse 22. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Verse 23, this, this is major. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto you. Whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. To remit is to forgive. Now, you're going to say, well, Jesus said that, that no man can forgive sins but God. Listen. Understand the context. He's telling them one more time. Binding, declaring unlawful. Loosing, declaring lawful. Both a legislative and a judicial context for that purpose, for that responsibility that the disciples had. All right, they were going to be preaching the gospel, the good news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which had never been preached before. They were going to be setting forth a new covenant at the direction, by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. They were going to be declaring things unlawful, things lawful, according to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. They were going to be offering the remission of sins. But there would also be a retaining of sins if they did not offer the remission. Listen, he was telling them, This preaching of the gospel, it's not an option. The only way someone's sins can be remitted is if they hear the gospel, they repent. Then those sins are remitted unto them. But if we withhold the preaching of the gospel, those sins are retained until such time as they hear and they make the decision It's still up to every man, woman, and child to make the decision to receive the forgiveness. But it was the responsibility of the disciples. When the Holy Ghost was received, the first thing they were instructed, the first thing they had to understand was, yes, the binding and the loosing, the understanding of 
giving direction concerning the law now transformed into an even greater responsibility, the preaching of the gospel being sent by and led by the Holy Ghost, preaching the gospel so that sins may be remitted, they may be forgiven. Also knowing some will be retained only by the Holy Ghost, Peter, Ananias, and Sapphira, those sins were retained, not by his choice. You understand, not by his choice. Stephen released them as he was dying. Father, lay not this charge to their account. So much greater responsibility, so much more important than binding a devil and loosing a blessing, which in the in in between Matthew 16 and Matthew 18, we also read the story of of Jesus sending Peter to fish and catch a coin in the mouth of the fish and pay their taxes. That also would have seemed like a good place for him to say, oh. We're going to loose this blessing, Peter, but he didn't. It's not about binding devils. It's not about binding storms. It's not about binding all the bad things in life and loosing all the good things. That's not what it's about. Find it in this, in this text. Find it in this context. It's not there. I've preached it that way. I try to live it that way. but I can't anymore because it's not there. But what is there is the most beautiful thing in 1 John chapter 2. Let's look beginning in verse 18. Little children, it is the last time. Well, if it was the last time then, it is way more the last time now. And as you have heard, that Antichrist shall come even now. Are there many antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time? They went out from us. Oh, that stings, but it's still true. The wheat and the tares, they are among us. We can't rip them up. Only he can in the last day. Oh, my goodness. But they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I I looked unction up in the original. It's the same exact word as we're going to see in verse 27. But the anointing which you have received of him, same word abideth in you and you need not that any man teach you but as the same anointing teaches you of all things and is truth and is no lie and even as it hath taught you ye shall abide in him we have the holy ghost dwelling within us who teaches us what's lawful what's unlawful how to present the gospel so there may be repentance and remission of sin understanding there may be times when people have to be put out from an assembly and their sins for a season are retained in hopes that they will repent and remission will come but none of this is at our discretion. We cannot become wise enough, smart enough. We cannot even say, oh, well, every bad thing in the Bible we're going to bind and every good thing we're going to lose, and we're just going to know. We're just going to know. No. Only the Holy Ghost knows. But we have this unction. Let me read you what it says that the unction is. It says in the original, unction is also anointing, referring to the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, your word is truth. He said the Holy Ghost would lead us 
into all truth. He leads us. He tells us what to do, how to do it. He tells us what's lawful and what's unlawful. There are some things that are simply convictions. Romans chapter 14 talks about it. And some who eat meat that was sacrificed to idols and have no problem with it. Others, it's a matter of conscience. If they ate that same meat, it would be sin unto them. What is that? That's the Holy Ghost in you teaching. It calls those who donate the meat weak. They might be called the little ones. They might be called those who are new in the faith or who have fear. Or, or perhaps they were involved in, in, in idol worship in a, in a heavy way and they're, and they're just terrified to touch that meat. But whatever the case, those who are considered stronger are to submit and humble themselves and meet the needs of those who are weaker. Although you say this is lawful and you're your friend says it's unlawful, you submit. Don't flaunt it. Don't flaunt your freedom in front of him. Don't cause him to stumble. Stumbling, offenses, forgiveness, remission of sins. This is what binding and loosing is about. Receive ye the Holy Ghost, whose sins you remit, they are remitted unto them, whose sins you you retain, they are retained. This is the heart of the gospel. I'm, I'm not going to tell you that I understand everything thoroughly, but understanding just this much, as I read the writings of John and Peter, as I read the letters of Paul, I've already begun reading some of them, but I know as I go forward, I'm going to see things differently because now I say, oh, the preaching of the gospel is the unveiling of that which is unlawful and lawful in the kingdom of heaven. I hope this helped you. I really do. I don't think that we're done unlearning. I know I've still got a lot of unlearning to do, but I'm so grateful to the Holy Ghost for having mercy on me and helping me to understand. Binding and loosing is not a style of prayer. It's not a decree or a declaration. It's a legal term. It's a judicial term. It's a term that was used throughout the scriptures. Acts chapter 2, when they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and Peter stood up to preach, what was he doing? He was unveiling in this new covenant because of the resurrection of Jesus. Here are new things you need to know that are unlawful and lawful. That's what the gospel is. I hope this helped. I hope you have a great rest of your day. I'll see you soon.